What is going on? I have a super special video for you today. We are going to be listening to Chat with Traders, which is one of the best podcasts out there for traders. And no, this is not sponsored by any means. I am simply a big fan of their podcast and I like to listen to the questions that the host ask. His name's Aaron, as you can see on the left, and he's, he's talking to James on the right here. And the reason I want to do this here and kind of start this new series is because a lot of my content right now is just building algorithms, right? So I wanted to show how do I come up with ideas? And this is one of the many ways is I just listen to other traders and what do they do? And how can I implement, implement that into my strategy? 99% of the time, it's not a step by a step by step like, hey, they lay out the strategy and then I am able to build the same thing. But I'll come up with ideas of, oh, maybe that's a better way to exit or maybe that's a better way to enter or maybe that's a good market to try out and so on and so on. So I wanted to bring you along for the ride as well and just kind of kind of brainstorm with you. So as you can see on the left here, it's this is a dollar cost average bot that we just built and I put on YouTube. I try to put everything on YouTube so you can just follow along and then kind of build your own strategies from that. Um, so today we're going to get started with this. I don't know if this is a, against the rules on YouTube or against the rules for chat with traders, but I'll make sure to put a link below so you can at least get to their channel, show them some love. Um, and it's just it's super beneficial for you if you are a trader. In my opinion, this is one of the best places to just hear from other traders. As you know, like trading, you do it alone every day. So you might as well listen to some good podcasts while you do it. So let's dive into it. Let me go ahead and start the show. I'll get my environment here on the left set up so I can start taking notes. And hey, maybe we'll even do a little bit of coding at the same time. So uh, the ultimate goal is to learn something from James and Aaron in this program and see how we can incorporate it into code. And hey, maybe we'll be able to automate the whole strategy. I'm sure if we continue this series, we'll be able to automate somebody's strategy and that would be pretty cool to do. So um, let's go ahead and get started. Is at skyquake underscore one. Now I've done enough talking. Here is special guest, James Chen. We won't spend too much time here, but uh, obviously because there's plenty of other things that I want to get into with you. Uh, but I think it's good to get some perspective on where you did begin. So I think uh, your origins as a trader was uh, you started trading a personal account in university. Yep. You know, how did you go then? Were you a gun trader from the outset? Did you have a bit of a knack for this naturally? Um, you know, what sort of things were you doing in those early days? Uh, I, I certainly thought I did. <laughs> it was, I think, 04 or 05. It was like a commodities bull market. I do distinctly recall BHP would go up every day and I would buy um, warrants in a thing. Warrants are just basically um, options for retail. And commodities are generally, um, they're less mean reverting, they have a lot of momentum. So every day you feel like a genius, right? And the thing goes up every day. And because I was leveraged via warrants, um, I felt like I was doing like, like every day the warrants go up by like 40% or something. And I roll into um, more leveraged warrants and then those will go up 40% the next day. By the way, let me know if this is too fast for you, but I, I try to listen to the these episodes on 1.5 speed because there are just so many episodes and I, I'm trying to get through all of them. But uh, yeah, I'm excited for this. So I was dealing with small amounts of capital, but like it felt really good thinking, wow, look at these losers making 20% a year <laughs> when I can make 40% a day. And I think like there was like a random pullback and everything went to zero. I was like, oh, okay, there's some nuance to this thing. But um, yeah, that was how I uh, cut my teeth on the um, on retail trading and getting into the market. And this is, you know, while I was learning about the CAPM, doing finance, learning about how to value an option and other interesting courses like uh, like when we're trying to teach us compound, compound interest in um, economics 101, I'm thinking, what the hell is going on here? So you were at university, like what were you studying? What was the original plan? Didn't really much have an original plan. I was doing a commerce slash law double degree. Didn't really enjoy the law part. I always enjoyed the finance math side a bit more. Yeah, but as I said, back then, like just kids that had no idea what was going what was going on, what I wanted to do. Just wanted um yeah, crave the uh, crave the excitement. And that obviously led you into uh, joining a prop trading firm. Yep. I think this was maybe a couple of years later, um, during the GFC. What was that like? So I joined Propex as part of their training group um, in 2008, right during the heat of the GFC. I think I was trading all kinds of derivatives, um, but scalping on the ladder um, was quite fun um, because, like, instead of you know, instead of learning how to scalp properly, um, the market environment rewarded them. Um, 
So this is always good, in my opinion, to listen. As sometimes I'll skip to like the strategy that they're running uh, and say, you know, it says what well, gaming the game index rebalances. So it kind of tells us what he he's about. But I I like listening to the intros because you kind of see what type of person they are and like for example are they like a high stakes person are they very risk averse and so on and so on so let's give this a full listen um and yeah if you have any questions let me know below and i'll try to answer them if if they're not able to answer them um, like reward a different kind of trading like if you held onto a position and the, the marks would have a big move you make like scalping was rewarded you were there for the really big moves um and i guess everyone in that um in the area was doing really really well because you're trying to make two or three ticks normally but then you have these 50 60 point moves in a straight line because a fund needed to get out or needed to get in it was a very interesting experience you make it sound like there was kind of um i don't know if incentive is the right word but you were kind of you were ideally there to be a scalper but yeah you gravitated yeah. more towards the holding on for those those bigger moves at the time yeah it was also um i guess lazier rather than scalping reading a book you just buy a set a two-point stop or something and then hope it goes your way okay and and there was a bit of um, bias because on the simulator, there was no slippage. You got instantly filled. And if it gapped against you, you got stopped out, usually for your two-tick stop. And if it goes your way, it goes 50 points or something. And is this, I, I presume this was trading um, treasury futures, like you're an equities trader today. We traded everything. Um, it was, we traded treasuries, um, SPY, uh, Hang Seng, FTSE, um, a lot of things, it, but basically all the instruments that were available during the UK, uh, during the Aussie session. Okay, so it was all futures though? Yeah, it was all futures. Okay, um, and so you came in during the training program. Um, you know, how did you go? Did you did you make it past that? Uh, no, towards the end, um, didn't make it past the training thing. It was, I guess it didn't really fit. Um. So I thought that was interesting. He, he said something about the simulator. I'm kind of assuming it's like a back tester, right? You come up with a strategy and then you're able to back test it. Um, maybe it's a forward test with the simulator, but it's funny, just the other day, I had a back test that was unbelievable. Like, it was so unbelievable that like I didn't believe it. And <laughs> I ran it for a few days and it just, back tests don't always work. And I feel like they're a good indicator, but it's not something to bank on, of course, because you never know, or the back test doesn't account for slippage, like how much did the market move when you try to get in or out? And it also doesn't account for non-fills like, for example, if you put a limit order and then it just never fills, well, the back tester are probably filled. A um, couple other things that I've seen while running strategies that have been back tested really well is that if you're watching a lot of my videos thus far, you know how I put my orders in. When I get a buy signal, I, I limit buy it and I just sit on the bid. But the back tester just buys it, right? And, and there's like a 0 0.0 or 0.1% fee commission, whatever. But in my live algos, there's a problem because if we place the bid and the market keeps going up, well, when that bot runs again in 30 seconds to a minute, it places the bid again at the bid. So for example, it might've put it at 1000 and waited 30 seconds and then now the price has gone up so now it's at 1005 and if it just keeps doing that it totally it changes things from the back test so uh yeah my personality and then um, i moved on okay and what was what was next at that time i was still at uni because the perfect program was over um was over the holiday so it was over the uni holiday so it didn't really affect my studies as much but um so after that went back to uni and then there was the trading places game uh, at that at that time, it's run by J.P. Morgan. Yeah, the, the game was sponsored by Droga Capital, which is now Blue Lake Partners, where I work. Basically, uh, the game ran for about a month, and uh, the winner was supposed to get an internship at uh, J.P. Morgan. Unfortunately, it was at the, right at the heart of GFC, and uh, J.P. Morgan did not see fit to offer any internships to anyone that year. Okay. Um, so you won that competition, right? Yes. Okay. And I believe there is a bit of a story as to how you won that. <laughs> I mean, would you mind sharing that? <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, so the, the system is designed where um, you could to be slightly realistic where um, if you're selling a stock, you're selling at the bid, and if you're buying a stock, you're buying uh, at the offer. So you're basically crossing the spread every time. Um, I think at the time it was also limited to the ASX 500, the old lords, not just the ASX 300. So there were quite a few. So what he's saying right now is everybody's crossing the bid or the ask right now, exactly the opposite of what I was just saying of how we enter orders. We sit on the bid, but what happens is we'll miss some of the trades because we're sitting on the bid and it doesn't fill. 
So what he's saying, this system is, is crossing the bid. And I know he's just telling a story, but the reason I'm putting this note down here is because I've actually heard of a lot of good systems that are more aggressive and they don't just fill on limit orders. They they'll cross the bid or the ask and just, and they will be the taker. So I trade a lot on Femex that pays me to be a maker, but I have to pay like three X what they pay me if I want to be a taker. So it's um, something I've stayed away from for the most part, but let me know what you do. Uh, I, I might, I might try some strategies that I just, more aggressive and just become the taker especially this one back test that i just had that had unreal results like the best i've ever seen and then we built a bot for it and it's not it's not matching up but i think that actually might be a good idea to just start taking instead of if your back test is so good maybe it'll work as the taker um illiquid stocks to choose from so um what i found out and also liquidity wasn't an issue either um you assumed to be able to do your full size on the bid offer and that was key. So what I did was um, I would find a, a micro cap stock that doesn't do any volume whatsoever with extremely wide spread. And I found a stock that had a bit of two cents and offer of 10 cents. And in my PA real trading account, I would put in an offer to sell like one share at three cents and no algorithms would come and pick it off because the stock is so liquid. And in a trading places game, I'll buy millions and millions of shares at three cents. Once that order is filled, I'll cancel my, um, my three cent offer in the real market, then put in a, um, a bid at nine cents um, in the real market. So now, the stock is trading nine bid, ten offered, and then I'll go into our trading places and sell millions of shares at nine cents. Um, I actually did get hit once or twice by real orders from real traders. Um, got a um, got a call from each trade after that asking was asking me what the hell are you doing, and I had to um, lie and say, oh, I was you know testing a couple of algos, testing on small size, blah blah blah, and they let me off the hook. That's that's hilarious. I mean, what was the I mean, what's the issue really? Like, why did each trade take um take an issue with that? I guess I was printing the stock up, printing the stock down. Like I did the intent to trade thing, and I guess it doesn't look good when you have a two cent stock selling trades at ten cents. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> so if I understand correctly, this is kind of like winning the competition. Originally, you were meant to get a job at JP Morgan. They weren't taking anyone, but it yeah. sounds like Blue Lake took you in. Yeah, exactly. Is that correct? Um, so how come they looked at this? D did they know how you won the competition? Oh, they did. They did. So um, I'm actually curious about you. What uh, Are you in this business in order to get a job and work for someone or are you trading your own capital? Yeah, let me know in the comment section below. I'm super interested about that because I know a lot of people go different ways. It sounds like James came out of college and was looking for a job, which is awesome. That makes sense. You're in college, probably had to pay a lot for college and all that good stuff. But this is awesome. Two smart guys. I'm having fun with this. They basically called me up and said, look, we know what you're doing. Um, we're going to take away your ill-gotten gains and you're going to have to start again. So I wasn't banned from the competition, which was very generous of them. Um, I think because I was already making some good money before I stumbled upon the um, exploit. And then, um, so then I kind of had to continue trading and um, got pretty lucky. And this is why I like listening to the intros because I can see this guy's kind of a risk taker, right? Like he's looking for exploits in even college games. So it tells me that I'm sure his strategy is going to be a little more risky. I haven't heard it yet. So this is the first time listening for me as well. So, um, but you know, there's nothing wrong with that. Like whatever, whatever type of personality you are, that, that that's who you are, and um, that's why it's so fascinating to listen to these guys because you know they're super smart. You know they figured something out, and it's just like such a wide array of personality types and different ways of looking at trading that I could never look at because I'm not in their brain, right? Like I ha I don't have their past experiences. That's why like I. I thought this would be a really good series to start just putting on YouTube because this is one of the best. I mean, this is the best, in my opinion. I don't know why I keep saying one of the best. This is the best podcast I've ever heard of uh, for trading. So I listen to it all the time. And if you've been watching my channel for a while, you know, I'm not, I don't put out videos that are not part of my daily life. And this is literally part of my daily life. I usually actually listen to this while I'm walking to walking somewhere or at the beach or playing video games or something like that. So I thought, hey, you know, I have, I filmed the code, which is my real life. Why not dive into this? So. Okay, here and there. And eventually I did win a competition through our skill alone. 
even without the benefit of my uh, ill-gotten gains. Interesting. I thought that was partly the the reason why they hired you, <laughs> is <laughs> because sure they sort was. of yeah, well. they figured it was like some kind of outside of the box thinking. You were you know looking for looking for a unique edge. <laughs> Super good point. He's always looking for an edge, and even without his little exploit, he found still was able to win. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, okay. So what year was this when you started at Blue Lake? Uh, it was 2009. 2009, right, okay. Right after the, uh, basically right after the worst of the GFC and all the market, uh, all the big caps were doing placements. I was helping, um, I was helping Blue Lake um, basically fill out all the forms for the various placements, um, back office, corporate action stuff. Okay, so you weren't really doing much in the way of trading. I was given a, um, a very small account to trade with in the beginning because when I joined, like they were just so busy with um, all the back office stuff. Yeah, and uh, after that, um, after that period, I was given a small book to trade and um, I was told to focus on ADRs and uh, index rebalancings. It was a bit of a legacy book. At that time, I had no idea what any of those things were. And I kind of grew into the role um, with a bit of mentorship from the senior traders there. Okay, cool. Well, that leads us into uh, index rebalances nicely. So let's just talk about that. Um, I'm not sure if this is something you still do um, to the same extent nowadays. I know ADRs are definitely a big part of what you do. So um, uh, we're going to dig into ADRs. But um, on the index rebalances, can you just talk a bit about you know some of the trades and what that actually means? Sure. Um, just a brief introduction on index rebalancing. Every quarter generally, funds need to rebalance their portfolios um, according to the S&P or the FTSE or the MISCI. Um, and based on the changes, the funds have to buy uh, large quantities and sell large quantities of stock. Um, since passive investing has grown so much in the past few years, these funds um, can have significant market impact. Um, when I first started trading them, it wasn't very well understood, even though the funds weren't very big. They were having um, outsized market impacts. And it was very lucrative. Like when I started trading them, um, I would get set two or three days before the rebalance actually happened um, to minimize my risk. Like, I'll, um, I'll, like if the rebalance will be happening on Friday, Arvo, I'll be buying it Wednesday or even Thursday and then flipping out everything on the Friday. Um, but as time has progressed, it has become remarkably more efficient rather than buying what gets added to the index. You know, you had to then start predicting what would be added to the index. And then eventually you started being, you know, I had to get in a week before the predictions were released and then a month before the predictions were released. And then um, it became like a meta game. I would, um, in the last couple of years, um, I would be trying to predict what Macquarie were going to release in the index note. So then I'll be selling on the, when Macquarie releases their note and you know all the clients start buying their stocks, it just became too much of um yeah, it became too much of a metagame and then the re returns went day more. You probably had the same amount of returns but it was spread over three months instead of two days. Okay. So how did you know what was likely to get added to the index? Like, you know, two days ahead of the official announcement, I guess. That's a great question. Excited to hear this answer. Uh, to recap, it sounds like he's just he or he used to be predicting, just kind of front running the index edition. So Tesla is about to get added to the index or something, and he buys Tesla prior to that, I think. But yeah, how, how do you figure this out? Um, how were you able to predict what was most likely to be added? Oh, no, um, in the beginning, um, they would announce it two weeks before the announcement. No, they would announce it two weeks before the rebalance event, and I would get in two days before the actual rebalance event. Oh. So I was just like reading an announcement and you know, copy pasting a bunch of stocks into an order blotter. But uh, yeah, as the question goes, um, right now, um, the indices release um, guidelines and consultation notes about how they, about the mechanics of, um, yeah, about the mechanics of how these rebalances happen. So then you kind of need to do the math, go through the index universe and find um, stocks that you think match the criteria, match the um, guidelines and will be added to the index. For the more mechanical indices, it's um, it's not too hard, but like um, it, they could be like 20 stocks trying to fill 10 spots and a lot of them are on the knife edge. And you could be buying them um, out three months in advance and half the stocks could have, for example, bad earnings, and then they will fall below the threshold, and then um, they would not be added to the index, and then you had to cut those. I guess slightly different question, but when you first started trading index rebalances, and you were buying the stocks that were going to be added two to three days before the, you know, if it was if they were getting added on Friday, you would be buying them on, uh, you know, Tuesday or Wednesday. Yeah. Why? This might sound like a silly question, but why did you think those stocks would be higher in two or three days' time? Uh, I did a brief back test and. Um, I looked at previous index rebalancings and then they would, I would notice these uh, massive Friday spikes in the auction. Like, I remember one year Northern Star gapped up 10% in the auction, right? And everyone's asking, oh, what the hell's going on? Um, this was when Northern Star was like a $1 stock and gapped down, gapped up to um, $1.12 or something. And later on, I found out, oh, the GDX um, gold index was buying Northern Star. And mm -hmm. after people became very confident that, you know, oh, this is a $2 billion fund, this is a $5 billion fund, blah, blah, blah. Um, there's a lot of money to be made front running these uh, uh, index additions and deletions. All right, so the ADRs, let's get into this. This makes up a big part of your trading from what I understand. Um, ADRs, if I'm not mistaken, is an abbreviation for American Depository Receipts. Yep. 
um, I'll use ADRs interchangeably with all kinds of um, cross-listed CDIs, dual listings, and whatever. Um, to me, they just they just mean if a stock trades in both Australia and a foreign jurisdiction. Okay, so an ADR is just yeah a dual listed stock, yeah. Yep, exactly. So what's the attraction here? Um, you know, can you just give a very brief overview for kind of how they function? Um, it's essentially the same stock, but it trades in multiple jurisdictions. Um, think of it as trading the ES during Asian hours, trading the ES during European hours, and then trading ES during the US hours. They will have a slightly different tinge to it, except with an, um, just, I'll take BHP as the premier ADR. It trades in the Australian market, and Australian fund managers have a certain view of it. It will trade in London, and the London fund managers will have a certain view of it, and it will trade in the US on the NYSE, and the US fund managers, again, will have a, maybe a slightly different view of it. So you can have these um, you know, uh, wildly different valuations subscribe to the same stock like Australian fund managers could be extremely bullish and the US fund managers could be extremely bearish on it so you can have um, every night the US will get sold off and every day in Australia the share will get bought and that creates um, opportunity are these ADRs uh, presuming that Australia is kind of like the main listing is that right and then these other ones are kind of like secondary listings is that one way to think of it is that generally accurate it's just generally the case but there'll be a couple of stocks like a ResMed where it trades um... so that's super interesting to me that you know, with ADRs, essentially, it's a stock that has two or more jurisdictions. So uh, in their case, I think they were saying Australia and somewhere else, but it's two or more jurisdictions. So one country, for example, Australia might be thinking one way of the stock, and then the US might be thinking like the exact opposite way of the stock. So one country could be bullish and one country could be bearish. So that makes me think like I trade mostly with crypto and that's why sometimes let me write this note down. Sometimes we see different markets almost from uh, while we're asleep in the US to when like, let's say China wakes up, the market changes. So build a bot that looks at the China market, because I think that's the exact opposite time almost. I think it opens at like 8 p.m. my time versus the U.S. market. And this could be Australia as well, but I think the China market is the, or the Asian market, I should say that, um, is bigger than the Australian market. I, don't, I actually don't look at the Australian market at all, but in crypto, it's like, oh, Asia just woke up. Or US, it seems like these are the two biggest players. So I feel like they're, you know, there's something we could build that looks at the patterns in both and says, hey, you know, well, if the US market did this, then the, the Asia market might do this. And I feel like we could build some ML or something that can read this better than we can as humans and find to find correlation so that that's awesome great great point james thank you james and aaron thank you for your kindness and sharing this information for us i like this the reason i love this podcast so much is because it's like these guys are so great at what they do but they're just sharing the information for free on a podcast and i know this isn't easy work for for the host aaron to you know, set things up and schedule and then do it for years and years on end. But man, there's a lot of good information in these. And, and like a lot of the stuff that we're writing down is just like, uh, like I can't think of that because I have so much stuff in my head and throwing on a podcast allows you to earn, insert somebody else like James and Aaron, their smart brains into, yeah. It's Australian company, but it trades far more volume in the US than it does in Australia. Um, Unibail Romanco is another example. It trades far more volume in Europe than it does in Australia. Do you prefer to trade stocks one way or the other? Uh, what do you mean? As in, like, do you prefer to trade stocks where they do the majority of the volume, let's say, uh, locally here in Australia? Well, I kind of have a trade on both sides, but um, uh, I would try to, um, I, would, I would generally try to trade the side with less volume first, because that's a harder side to do more volume is. Just taking a step back, um, one interesting quirk of these of ADRs is, um, they're not, it's never a live up. Like Australia is never open at the same time as the US, excluding post market. You know, Australia is never open at the same time as Europe. So you can't directly, you, you know, buy, buy Australia and sell Europe. To, to, um, to, um, I, would, I would generally try to trade the side with less volume first, because that's a harder side to do more volume is. Just taking a step back, um, one interesting quirk of these of ADRs is um, 
they're not, it's never a live app. Like Australia is never open at the same time as the US, excluding post market. You know, Australia is never open at the same time as Europe. So you can't directly, you know, buy, buy Australia and sell Europe to, to, um, to ARP for free profit. You have to take timing risk. Like you could buy Australia and then during the European hour something happens and the stock is significantly higher or significantly lower. And then you kind of had to make a judgment call on, on whether it's, well, it's still cheap versus Australia or it's still expensive versus Australia. Okay. I guess uh, just to my previous question, what I was sort of trying to get at is, you know, when you gave that example of, um, you know, Australian fund managers might have a certain view on BHP and then, uh, you know, fund managers in the US might have a certain view on BHP over there. Um, like, is there, if the primary listings in Australia with it does the most volume here locally, mm-hmm. you, you kind of presume that that's maybe the more efficiently or correctly priced? Yeah. Yeah. As you said, the more um, correct price. So if Australia is up 10% versus the US, I might not try to fade it because um, the, the US would be like, well, Australia is up 10%, we'll just follow along. But um, if the US is up 10% on low volume versus Australia, um, there is a, and especially if Australia does more volume, um, Australian fund managers going, look, those Yanks have no idea what are talking about. This is Australian stock. I know exactly how it should behave, and you know, I only trade up five percent or something. So you can have these massive discrepancies um, in pricing. Right. So let's let's talk about this because, like you just said, it's not really. I know some people kind of refer to it as an arbitrage kind of play, but like you said, there's definitely the, the timing risk is a factor. So it's not really a, a true arbitrage, right? Yeah. It's um often it's a it's a very mixed scenario. Like um again, I'll take BHP as an example, right? So overnight, um the general trade is up, if BHP is at a discount, I'll buy it. If it's at a premium, I'll sell it. Then I have to consider, okay, is the S&P up 200 points? If the S&P is up 200 points and BHP is only at the 1% premium to Australia, I'll most likely be buying it. And then I have to look at, okay, what else drives BHP? Is the copper price up a lot as well? Generally, copper is positively correlated with S&P. Um, so I tend to be, um, oh, you know, the usual scenario is that S&P is up, copper is up, uh, iron ore is up, and I'll be trying to buy BHP at a you know, 1% premium to Australia because tomorrow I think BHP will be up at least 3%. Okay. Yeah. So I guess that's kind of the nuance in the trade, right? Yeah, exactly. It gets more complicated if um, it has a lot of different leads, like uh, the S&P is up, but the miners are down and copper is down. But iron ore is up, but Rio Tinto is down in London as well. So then you get all these mixed signals about where you think BHP should be trading. And that's when you kind of widen your, I guess, your valuation band of what you think BHP should be. Rather than saying, you know, BHP should be up 1% tomorrow, I'll say BHP should be up 0 to 2% tomorrow. So I won't buy it if it's flat, but I'll buy it at, you know, maybe a one or maybe even two percent discount to Australia. So it's interesting. He made a good point. Like I think he said earlier, he was saying, oh well if the US market is up ten percent on a Australian stock, well people in the US don't know anything about this company. I've been tracking it here for X many months, years, whatever. It should only be at five percent. So that's where like an arbitrage comes into play. Well, not quite an arbitrage, but a trade, right? Like, okay, let's trade it back to the 5% mark. So my question is in crypto, how can we use that to our advantage? How to use, uh, what would you call it? Regional knowledge to find trades. Example, what do we know that the other side of the world doesn't other side of the world doesn't and then for those watching like what do you know that this side of the world doesn't because then for example if you saw like let's say i don't know I'm trying to think of a coin back in the day like neo was a very it was like the They were calling it the Chinese Ethereum. So if somebody's been tracking NEO and it goes up 30% in the US time, but that person that lives out there and knows NEO very, very well, thinks it should only been up 10%, then they could short it, right? Short it from 30 to Ten, if they really believe that. So I'm trying to think, like, what in what scenarios can that work for us? Because that's something that can be definitely automated. Um, I, I started to build the code out here just to get this bot going, but uh, let's keep the show going. Let me know if you have any thoughts on that, though. Where were you on March 9th, 2022, when President Biden signed the death warrant on American freedom? 
How much discretion is going into this versus how much of uh, these decisions are systematic? <laughs> I've been trying to automate this for uh, many years now <laughs> because you know I'm only trading this at night and um, uh, I would like to you know click a button and I go to sleep, but often that's uh, quite impossible. Um, I like to think there's quite a, like I have very spreadsheets out to take advantage of this, but often you know I'm looking at charts of the S&P, I'm looking at how Valley is going, I'm looking at the Aussie dollar, I'm looking at how Rio is going, I'm looking at how um, the US minus ETF is going. Looking at how South 32 is performing, um, there are factors I can code into it, but there's a, always a discretionary element, which makes it a bit tricky. Uh, I'd say 50% discretionary, 50% systematic. Now, the part you haven't really addressed here is, um, you know, should you, you know, if you just want to stick with this example of BHP here, um, let's say you buy BHP. So that's awesome to hear that he's been trying to automate this. Sounds like he's a coder himself, so uh, he's trying to automate as much as possible, but he thinks that 50% is discretionary. But at the end of the day, like, like I said at the start of this video, most of the time it's not me jumping on here and just like automating somebody's strategy. It's it's all of these notes that come to my mind based off of these smart guys' um, thoughts, right? HP um, in the US overnight, well, yep. overnight for us in Australia. What's the exit plan? Yep, that's also another tricky bit. Um, often I found it's best if I just try to sell it ASAP the next day. Sell it in Australia? Yeah, sell it in Australia um, as soon as possible. A lot of people are going to sort of not know how you're able to do that. Can you just explain that part of it? Several ways I can do it. If I'm buying the the US stock, if I'm buying BHP in US, um, I can A, convert the stock to Australia via my broker. So I'll buy BHP US and they'll deliver me BHP Australia and they'll take out Forex uh, for me. Or I can do it manually myself, which means um, in the end, I end up long, say, 10,000 BHP US and short 10,000 BHP Australia. And sooner or later, I have to collapse that or um, take the opposing trade. Uh, which approach is, is most common? Like how do you decide when you're going to, you know, if you're long US, you're going to short Australia on the open or whether you're going to convert the shares um, through your broker? Um, generally, I try to do most of the DMA because um, if I pay, because brokerage for these things, because it's a, a fairly special transaction, um, brokerage is quite expensive and the edge is, um, the edge obviously gets eaten up if I'm paying um, full commission on these trades every single time. There's also conversion fees on top of the brokerage. Um, so often um, what I'll do is I'll look at my current positions. Uh, for example, currently I'm short uh, let's say I'm short 100,000 BHP US and I'm long 100,000 BHP in Australia. If my trade is to increase that position on both sides, I might say, well, look, I don't really want to increase both sides anymore. I'll do it through a broker. But if my position would decrease both sides, it's like, oh, okay, cool, I'll do that. Um, I'll do those DMA. So then I'll kind of naturally um, wind down that position. Okay, and DMA is? Oh, I'll just be hitting the market directly. Okay. Um, now, I think there might be a concrete example you can share um, for a PLS trade that you did. Yes, yeah, so that was one um, on the 24th of February, right during the uh, Ukraine fears and um, the Ukraine-Russia uh, invasion fears. Um, I don't specifically remember which geopolitical headline caused it, but Australia... Got oh, by the way, I've got a bot running down here. As you can see, we just hit our target here on whatever this is. One of my favorite things about algo trading is I don't even know most of the tickers. Got sold off very hard, and the ES was down like 60 points. POS is not really a, an ADR, but it does trade in Germany um, on the Frankfurt Exchange and on TradeGate. It's obviously much, much more liquid in Australia, but um, you have a bunch of European investors who love the lithium game, and they invest in this thing. So, you know, when the European so Australia was down, I think 5% or so, um, had a pretty bad day. All the lithiums got smashed, um, and all the risk on names got smashed. But when Europe, Europe opened, there was like a full blown panic. It okay, so hold on, let me just interrupt you there. PLS was down 5% in Australia for the day. Yep. Okay, yeah. So Europe, the European indices opened down about 5% as well, and POS and a couple of the um, other European uh, ADRs of Australia, um, they opened down nearly 10%. So they will add an additional 5% discount to Australia. So with something like POS, it's, you know, it's a very volatile stock, so like a 5% move can be considered not too uncommon. So then it, it comes to a decision like, okay, what's the S&P doing? It's a spy up versus the close. Um, what's BHP doing? Um, at that time, the market looked like it was kind of bouncing. SPY was up a little bit from where Australia closed and POS being a 5% discount was, um, yeah, it just felt incredibly cheap. Okay. So how much was it down then in, um, uh, where does it trade? Germany? Yeah, this one's trading Germany. So how much was it down like in Germany on the day? Down 10%. 10%, okay. So which was um, at a 5% discount to Australia. Gotcha. Okay. And as the ES started rallying and Europe kind of rallied, um, there was a seller in POS um, and generally, um, POS doesn't do a lot of volume in Germany. So when a lot of volume comes in, I have to check and make sure there's no negative news and someone's trying to take advantage of, um, yeah, someone's taking, trying to take advantage of it and trying to offload it. Um, check around everywhere, make sure there was no news. And I was, you know, I was happy to buy POS at a discount when the SPY, I think at the time, was up 1%.
And this continued on for a while. So I was buying everything um, the seller had to sell. And um, by the time the US had opened, I think the market was up nearly 2%. And the seller in POS got more aggressive. At this point, you know, I had to take a step back and think, okay, I had to double check the news. Has there been a coup? Is there something news I'm not sure about? You know, has China said something new about lithium or whatever? Had one of the partners blown up? Checked everywhere, checked Bloomberg, Reuters, Twitter, all the um, social media sites. No news. And meanwhile, the ES was still rallying and the seller was still kind of walking the stock down. Then that's kind of like when you had to make a discretionary judgment call that um, um, that the seller just wanted to get out of the sector. Had a bunch of stock in the illiquid um, exchange, Germany, and he probably wasn't able to sell in Australia, so he just wanted the whole thing gone. And I was happy to, um, yeah, and I was happy to take everything he had to sell. Okay, so when you talk about just a couple of things, when you talk about the seller, you make it sound like it's just one person, um, and I, I know that's what you're getting at as well. Mm-hmm. How were you able to identify that? I keep a spreadsheet of Arvol of um, premium and discounts. Usually, um, if it's just a couple of retail trading volumes very low, the premiums and discount can get absorbed by market makers. But if there's a larger volume going through, or if the uh, the premium discount to the Aussie price is very big, I'll have a closer look. And um, also, again, I also look at liquidity on the uh, different lines. Like Germany does maybe, you know, usually 0.1% of Australian volume. So if Germany starts approaching 1% Australian volume, then it's like, okay, this is, you know, a sign to pay attention. Something's happening here. Either someone knows something and something's stock or something else. So what did PLS close down on the day in Germany? Like what percent? Um, it got down as much as 15. But in the end, um, in the end, but because I was buying... I was buying as much as I could get my hands on. Um, in the end, it closed down 10, which was a 5% discount to Australia. Okay. So what, I mean, is there any reason why you were so confident that, you know, you weren't going to come in the next morning and, you know, Australian traders, investors see PLS is down 10% in Germany overnight um, and then it starts getting marked down on the open uh, in Australia? Yeah, there's, there's always that fear. But that's when, um, again, that's when um, uh, volume comes in. Like PLS does um, about 30 million shares a day in Australia. Right. And then, um, so, uh, and this is super, super interesting. I'm really into this. <laughs> and I have actually been forgetting that I am recording a video here. So, my apologies if you're, if you are looking for, for insights from me, but these guys are super smart and I'm really enjoying this. But I know this video is getting a bit long. So, since this is a new format for me here, uh, I just wanted to kind of show you what, how I come up with strategies and how, other people's thoughts help me think of different ways to look at the market and like just learn more because you know i'm never going to be done learning there's always going to be new stuff new strategies new ways of coding and i appreciate you so much for watching along and learning with me because some of your comments help me learn as well and that's all i'm trying to do is learn every single day and there's awesome podcasts like like this one that we're going over today uh, but yeah, I know my video is getting long. So what I want you to do is if you want me to finish this podcast, just go ahead and let me know below. Say podcast part two or say part two. Just say part two below or give me a thumbs up and I will make sure to pick up here where we left off. Let's just go ahead and copy it over here um, just like this. And we stopped at the what? The 33 three five mark and i promise i won't listen to this without you even though i listen to, to this a lot uh listen to i'm trying to listen to all of the all of the podcasts but i went in reverse order so um, now we're starting in fresh order so if you like this let me know i will uh make part two with you if you're interested uh just say part two below um let's see what else if you want all my code I put it all in the Algo Trade Camp below. There's a link for that. But uh, yeah, if you're excited for part two of this, go ahead and uh, like, subscribe, and I'll see you in uh, that next that next part.